Greetings. In this episode, we finally start painting some miniatures here at Bunker 6. Welcome back to Bunker 6. This is a very special episode because we are finally getting round to painting some of these models in my collection. I thought I'd start with a very iconic model which is the Rhino Tank and as you can see we are just doing the priming. Normally I prime in black but because we're doing a light colour like a yellow I preferred to paint a grey instead. Once the priming has dried, which shouldn't take too long, you don't really need too much of it, as long as you've got a good solid coat that bites onto the surface of the paint, you'll move on to the base coating. And here we are using Games Workshop's Avaland Sunset. Now I'll be pretty much following the exact battle ready and tabletop ready instructions that Games Workshop supply, with a couple of twists here and there with some colours that I actually prefer over the Games Workshop range. And I know I'm using an airbrush, but of course this is just base coating, so it's very easily done with just a paintbrush too. Now we have the priming and base coating out of the way, we get to move on to the mid-tone. Mid-tone is basically the average colour across the entire spectrum that you're going to be using on the model. Not the darkest and not the lightest, just somewhere in between. Now when we're doing this we're going to also be using what's called the zenithal technique, where you basically paint the paint in a certain direction which is supposed to imply a light source. So in this instance I want the light source to appear that it's showering down on top of the tank. So I'm avoiding painting too much of the lower half of the model and sticking to painting the brighter colour here on the top parts of the model. You see what we want to try and imply is lightness and shadows through colour tone and so once we've got this top half nice and bright it adds that nice extra layer of contrast without having to do too much work. Now we're moving on to the base coating of the metallic sections so that's going to be the tracks, the exhaust pipes and the turret guns. Not really too much to say here apart from just take your time and don't be too impatient when it comes to the amount of pigment that is able to cover a surface. I definitely recommend two or even three layers depending on what particular metallic paint you're working with. Do bear in mind that you are literally pushing around little flakes of actual metal so it's not necessarily going to work just like in a regular acrylic paint would. Now, as you can see, I'm using a brush here that's been chewed up by one of my dogs, and that's a good thing because you don't particularly want to use a very good brush because if you do use a good brush, as I mentioned, these metallic paints have actual metal in them and it can damage your brush over time. So I'm just using an old janky brush here to get the base coat done. That's all you really need. Now my regular PSA when it comes to metallic paints is whatever you use to rinse your brushes with after using metallic paint, always give that container of water a good clean afterwards because you don't want any of those metallic flakes of paint left in that pot and ending up anywhere else. That is always a real possibility. As previously mentioned, coverage can be an issue with metallic paints, so I highly recommend just keeping the paint quite fluid and not too thick because that thickness can really make things sticky and clunky very quickly. And here are the finished metallic sections. Now this is a pretty brief section, there's only a few areas that require black paint and you'll see that in the rest of this video, but we're going to be using in this instance the scale colour black paint because I prefer the matte finish of this paint over say a bad and black which I feel has a bit of a shine to it. I've only just recently come to using this paint and I really do enjoy it, it has very predictable and manageable properties that I find really work very well at this scale. And talking of scale, I'm using quite a skinny little brush here, I think it's a zero in my hand at this point. You can use a size one brush too, but really you won't want to go anything higher than that unless you're doing large surface area glazing sections, and for that I'd only recommend a size two brush. Now we're moving on to another Bunker 6 first, which is doing a oil pin wash. But in order to do that, we must first varnish the model with a gloss varnish. Not a matte varnish, it has to be a gloss varnish in order for the oil paints not to damage what is underneath. 
Well, here are some of the things that I have learned from doing oil pin washing. It's a bit scary and intimidating at first because one, you don't know if you're getting the right consistency with the oil paint and you don't know if the gloss varnish is going to start taking out details that you want to keep, but it's actually been pretty smooth sailing. You save a ton of time with the way in which the oil paint seeps into all the nooks and crannies, unlike say something like an Agrax Earthshade, and also you have this amazing advantage of the pigment. Oil paint has a much higher pigment count than say something like Agrax Earthshade. It's not Agrax Earthshade's fault, it's a completely different material. Another huge advantage with oil is the fact that you can easily repair it. If you put the paint somewhere you don't want it, just grab a Q-tip with some mineral spirits on the end and dab away the error that you made. As you can see, the results speak for themselves. I have left this model to dry for 24 hours to really make sure that oil paint isn't going anywhere. I'm using a particular brand of paint that has less oil in it, which is meant specifically for model making, which has an even quicker drying time. We've now covered the model in matte varnish, so we can continue the painting process. Now, everything we've been doing so far is pretty elementary, but we're going to be moving on to something called glazing. Now, glazing gets a little bit tricky if you don't know what you're doing. And I'm one of those people, generally speaking, that doesn't know what they're doing. But some of the little things that I've picked up along the way, especially when doing this model, have been really game-changing for me. So, for example, normally I would just twist my brush once I've got the amount of paint on it that I want in the wet palette still, rather than doing it on a kitchen towel like I'm using underneath my hands here. Taking it to a kitchen towel and just wiping off any excess fluids has really been a game changer because it's reduced the potential for watermarks. Now watermarks is a huge issue when it comes to glazing because you're pushing pigment very thinly across the surface, but you still need fluid. So it's a little bit of a catch-22 situation. But if you just wipe it off and take your time and know that not necessarily the first three or four or five layers of glazing are going to really achieve any particularly great results, you will eventually start seeing the results you're looking for. You just have to be patient and also know where you want your pigments to go. If you don't know where you want your pigments to go, your paint job is going to be a confused mess. So have a solid direction of where things should be glazing to and from. So we know we wanted to start bright on the top of this tank and work our way down to darker areas at the bottom of the tank to imply a light source. And as you can see here, we've been pulling and pushing pigment down to the bottom of the model and trying to keep the top of the model as light as possible to imply that tonal contrast as well. Now, this might seem like a complete overkill situation with just one Rhino tank, especially at epic scale when you're going to have a multitude of these vehicles maybe on a battlefield. So what's the point in going crazy like this? Well, the whole point of this is to show you where you can take things, even at this scale. But if you just want a tabletop ready model, I would say stopping at the Uriel yellow stage is a good idea. Add your metallics, any additional color base coats that you also want to do. Then add your wash, however you see fit, and a very simple bright yellow dry brush, avoiding any metallic sections. But if you're a sadist like me, please continue watching because we've got plenty more painting to do. Now, as you can see, we're just really trying to ramp up the contrast between these yellows and browns. I'm putting darker and darker colors into the recesses and lower parts of the models are where the dark tones will be happening. And we're pushing the brighter sections, obviously, at the top of the model to keep that light source contrast going as we started the zenithal process with. Now, glazing is a super slow process, and you can see basically barely any pigment is coming off my brush here. That's for one very good reason, control of outcomes. If you start throwing too many colors and too many pigments down too soon, you won't be able to take your time and really see where things are going. As you can see, we're really pushing this contrast, but we're taking our time with it. We're dragging the pigment where it needs to go, and because there's barely any pigment on my brush to start with, we're lowering the risk of watermarks. And when I first started glazing, I had way too much fluid on my brush, but it's because I was basically trying to wet blend with thin paint, not the way to go. Please bear in mind that this process will take about five to six hours if you're new to all of these techniques. Anyone can do this as long as you take your time. I am no expert by any stretch of the imagination, but if you just try and treat the brush not like a paintbrush, but just a scraper and dragger of pigment, then you'll be in much better shape psychologically of how you're supposed to be getting these pigments around the model. 
Now, if you're very impatient like I am, it's good to sometimes change things up a little bit. So I didn't want to go too far down the rabbit hole of my darker tones, so I decided to move on to some of the brighter tones at the top of the tank. And as you can see here, you make the areas where you want brighter and brighter contrast smaller and smaller. And the same can be said for darker areas too. If you have everything dark, then there is no contrast. If you have everything bright, there is no contrast. And just like the head of an arrow, in order to get that sharpness, you have to take things to a point. And as you can see here, this is the result so far. I decided to use Dark Reaper Blue instead of a grey to start highlighting this black because I like the addition of the blue that's in this colour. It's also very nice when you start highlighting up by just adding a little bit of white to this paint. It adds that little extra twist because it has the blue that the grey highlights just don't have. And just as before, we're going to be doing some minor glazing here where we're pulling the blues to the edge. Just a little bit of moisture on the brush and just to make sure that those transitions are happening as smoothly as possible. Now all I've done here is add a little bit of scale color white to the Dark Reaper mix and as per always you just reduce the area by which you want to highlight in order to create that emphasis of contrast which is what we're doing now. Now I can't call myself a real authentic Epic 40k channel if I don't do some additional Epic 40k shilling so here it goes. This is a great model to try and learn some of these glazing techniques with. As you can see, it's small, you can use barely any paint, and also you've got these tiny areas to try and create the contrast with. You can build up your confidence slowly and surely with a model like this, and then take some of these techniques to a small part of a 28 millimeter scale model that you might be working on. For example, the gun of an intercessor marine. That's also, you know, the same size theoretically, surface area wise, of this tank. And what you've learned say in how to glaze the blacks you could transfer that onto that intercessor gun as well and then work your way up slowly but surely onto the body panels from say some of the techniques that you've learned on the body panels of the rhino here it's things like that these tiny little micro steps that can really help build the confidence elsewhere in your hobbying the smaller the area that you're trying to highlight you're probably going to want to have a more extreme highlight added there. For example, corners are going to want to have the brightest parts and the darker recesses are going to have the darker parts, obviously. Now, it wouldn't be a Games Workshop painting tutorial if Nuln Oil wasn't involved, so here is some Nuln Oil. I just used it on the exhaust pipes. You could, of course, use an oil wash if you're crazy, but I couldn't be bothered to gloss varnish the model again just for that tiny step. Nuln Oil will do the job satisfactorily on this occasion. Now, one other thing that makes a Games Workshop model stand out are the very, very subtle black outlines that they do on things. And so I wanted to make the exhaust pipes here stand out a little bit more, so I added a very thin black outline to the edges of them to give it that additional pop. This thin black outline also helps disguise any staining that could have occurred from the Nuln Oil wash as well. And speaking of Nuln Oil staining things, let's start chucking a bunch of Nuln Oil on a cheap old brush and throwing it at the tracks of this tank. You want it, of course, to be worked into the recess areas to increase the levels of contrast. But let's be honest, this area of the tank is not going to be getting too much attention, so you don't need to be too careful about what you do here. Once you've applied the amount of wash that you want to add, just let it dry. Now, for the sake of the length of the video, I didn't film the entire five hours of me painting this tank, but as you can see, I have applied the same techniques that I showed at the beginning of this video across the rest of the tank in terms of contrast and glazing with those browns and yellow highlights. Now we're moving on to the headlights. We've done a base coat of Prussian blue. We're now adding a black to the top of the headlamp, which might seem counterintuitive, but once again, we're trying to add contrast. Once we've done this step, we're going to add lighter and lighter blues to the base of the headlamp and finish it off with a white dot flare to imply that these headlamps are indeed made of glass. You want to drag these lighter blues down from the middle of the headlamp towards the base and make that area of the blue smaller and smaller, the brighter and brighter the blue you intend to go. The movements are barely happening when it comes to these stages. You want to make sure the paint moves nice and quickly off the brush, especially when you're doing such tiny movements. 
Now I'm pulling a bit of the paint back onto the actual body panels of the tank itself, so I'll be adding a thin black outline as you can see on the base to tidy things up. We're now adding that glassy flare at the top to imply the reflection and the headlights are done. Really all that's left to do is clean up these metallics and give them a little bit of pop like we've done with the rest of the model. Now working with metallics and creating pop can be a little bit tricky because they've already got a natural shine to them. But if you start quite dark, you get yourself an option to go quite bright in terms of contrast. But right now we're just using a very, very subtle Iron Breaker Games Workshop metallic paint to clean things up a little bit. But then finally, after we just cleaned up these exhaust pipes, we're going to be hitting it with a Vallejo Silver, which really makes things pop as much as you'd want them to. And because this is the brightest silver, we're going to not be using it too much. We're just going to be adding it to the base of all of those exhaust outlets, and that's about it. And here is the finished model. Sorry it took so long, but we did finally get there in the end of painting some epic miniatures, and there are plenty more as you know if you've seen my previous videos to come. But as always, if you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up, and if you're new here and you like what you see, please consider subscribing. But as always, until next time, I've been Vincent, signing off from here at Bunker 6.